Maurice Parker, welcome to the uh, Pickle Tato, whether you want to call it a podcast, conversation, whatever. Right. Um, better known as Mo. Everybody knows you as Mo. Yes, sir. Got anybody still calls you Maurice? Yeah. Except for your mom? Yeah, my, my uh, wife does. Mm. My mother-in-law does. And then uh, a couple of guys I grew up with. Everybody else is Mo. Yeah. Well, the reason I asked you to come, and I'm very grateful that you did, is because uh, I know your background, and I think it's very interesting, and um, I want to get into a lot of it, as much as you can talk about, and we'll talk about why. Maybe you can't talk about some of that stuff, but um, anyway, glad to have you here, man. All right. Glad to be here. So as long as I've known you, I still don't know anything about your childhood, how you grew up, where you was at, and so can you go over that a little bit? I mean, what led to this Famous Mo Parker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. For sure. For sure. So I grew up in uh, West Texas in El Paso, Texas, born and raised. Right. So um, a lot of people, you know, Texas is a huge state, but El Paso's out in the western, western edge there, pinned between New Mexico and Mexico, literally on the border. Right. It's a border. Everyone calls it a border town, but it's a city. You know, I don't know. If I had to guess now, it's, you know, maybe 700,000. Uh, legal residents and another few hundred thousand illegal, but you've got six million people right across the border, which is, you know, the real war is right there. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, real interesting dynamic growing up there. Uh, you see a lot, and uh, it was, it was interesting, right? I didn't come to appreciate it until I moved away. You know, I joined uh, the military not too long after high school, so I didn't come to appreciate. Um, the experience until much later in life. So what do you appreciate about it that you didn't appreciate back then? Well, you don't really, I think a lot of times just in general, you know, I, you know, like you, you know, raised kids and stuff. So when you're growing up, there's just a lot of, a lot of experiences you just don't really, I, I'll say appreciate because you don't really understand because life's just kind of happening. Right. Then you'll reflect on things and then you'll be able to kind of discern some things from your personality that comes specifically from stuff. Cause you know, we are who we are because of what we've been through. Yeah. Right. So I had a lot to do with that. And I think really is I've lived in lots of different places and I've always just been kind of able to relate and get along with a variety of folks and I attribute it to the environment in which I grew up with, yeah. you know, makes it, sense. Yeah. It was predominantly, you know, um, Hispanic population, but you, when you're not that, you know, as I like, I joke around and say, you know, I was raised in a single parent household. So, you know, you know, black kid raised by a white mom in a Hispanic town. Right. So you just kind of have to figure it out. Yeah. Right. And so that caused any problems like, um, like childhood, you know, when I was growing up, you know, you had a kind of similar dynamic, but it was predominantly white and not known it back then. But there, I mean, looking back on it now, there was racism in my school and I didn't even know it. Yeah, for you know sure. I mean? yeah. It was like, yeah, there was, a, there was a lot of that. I look back on that now. Times are different. And I'm, not, you know, a lot of times guys our age, ah, times are different. And you kind of say that with a tone like now people are less capable or less something, but. There's things that you're exposed to or that you'll tolerate that people now won't tolerate. They're just not having it. Right. Right. And I think that's probably a good thing. Yeah. But, uh, so yeah, there was, there was a ton of that, you know, there's clearly, there were certain places you didn't go. If they weren't for you, you just didn't go there. So did it make any kind of trouble for you or you uh, just kind of like stayed out of it? Yeah. Any you know, fights? I mean, yeah, you know. the, you, <laughs> I mean, everybody gets in fights, but I mean, yeah, like, everybody gets in that stuff. Uh, there was yeah, always lots of fights. I was pretty fortunate in that, you know, we would get in trouble. Um, but as I have to look back on it, you know, I had, I was just fortunate in that, uh, you call it luck or the sixth sense or whatever, that I just never crossed the lines you just couldn't get back from. Right. Yeah. Right. I know lots of people who did. I don't know why I didn't. I don't, you know. Well, I would think it has something to do with your mom, don't you think? Keeping you straight, maybe? Or I think so, um, to a certain degree, but I think I do think because she was 
you know, when I was growing up, my mom was trying to survive, you know, literally trying to keep the lights on and stuff. So the, you certainly didn't want to disappoint her, but if I really look back on it, I don't know if that was really the forefront. I think that what I really, what it was, I always watched her, you know, scraping every day and just working super hard to get somewhere. She might not have even known where she was trying to get to, but I think I, at some level, I obviously appreciated that because I wanted to work hard and get somewhere too. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I, 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 as I'm saying this right now, I think, yeah, that's probably, you know, a big reason of it, but I don't think, you know, um, it was this overriding lecture of, you know, you've got to do this, don't do that. Kind of like I do my kids. Sure. I've been way more of a lecture with my kids and my mom was with me. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit sure. deeper because I've been with you with your kids and uh, extremely impressed in your parenting okay, for sure. style. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. But so coming up to high school, um, you know, everybody has a reason why they go in the military, whether it be college or, hey, I want to serve my country or was there something that pushed you in that direction? A hundred percent. So El Paso is a military town with Fort Bliss. So there's always exposure. But right out of high school, I, I dilly-dallied for a while. You know, I didn't know, ah, do I want to go to college? I don't, yeah, I'll go. No, I don't want to go. So at the last minute, I decided to go to school. And uh, I went to a real small school in South Dakota on a football and track scholarship. And, uh, you know, went to school for a year. And I just, I just wasn't ready. Mm. So during this time, you know, I had fun playing sports. But... Uh, you know, just school just wasn't for me at the time. I didn't know what was for me. And I had a roommate whose dad was in the National Guard. So as I'm contemplating, you're talking to your roommate regularly, as I'm contemplating, you know, I'm like, uh, yeah, this school thing's not for me, man. I'm going to go back home. And he's like, you know, we have the discussion. Hey, my dad's in the National Guard and says, you can join the National Guard and go to school for free. And you know what? we can join together and we can go to basic training together. It'll be just like here. And I'm like, yeah, sounds good. So fast forward five months, I'm in basic training by myself. My, bu <laughs> my buddy's nowhere to be seen, right? Where'd he go? Um, he, he, did, he ended up joining the guard later. We just didn't do it on the same timeline. Mm. And I haven't talked to him in a, a million years. So I think, he's, I think he lives in North Carolina now. But so I ended up in the National Guard and um, – I started out as a 13 Foxtrot, a Ford Observer. Mm -hmm. So you go to basic training. You get That's all what this, I did in the Marine Yeah, Corps. you get all this cool training. And I liked basic training. Uh, I liked AIT. You know, I didn't like getting yelled at and stuff, but I just liked the physical aspect of it. I just liked working. And then I got to my guard unit and, uh, oh, it was a culture shock. You know, I was literally the youngest, one of the youngest kids in the unit. And we would have drill and, you know, guys would want to stay there and smoke cigars and play poker. And I was, you know, 19. And I was like, yeah, I can't do, there's no way I can do this. There's no way. So literally, you know, two couple months into my, you know, I, I got all the training out of the way, but a couple months into my guard time, I was like, I have got to figure out how to get past this. Cause it, it was like a six year commitment. And I was, I, I knew that knowing me, I said, there's no way I'm going to make it. So were you, you were still going to school during that time? Yeah. So okay. I, I still, you know, I started going to school, you know, at the local college there at UTEP and uh, still didn't do much better. You know, didn't know what I wanted to study, just, you know, did okay, but didn't do great. So I was going to school, I was in the guard and I had a, you know, a job, delivered furniture. No. And, uh, you know, I don't know, six months into that. Uh, we had, we, we were, it was hot in El Paso. We delivered to some customer and you'd find yourself delivering furniture and the salesman would make some deal about, yeah, my guys, if you buy this refrigerator, my guys will rearrange your whole house. <laughs> right. right. So we yeah. come off of one of those deals. And you didn't get none of the tip. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we're driving and I'm driving with the guy I'm working with and we passed a, a Air Force recruiter and I had read an article in Time Magazine about uh, top trends of the nineties for careers. And like uh, air traffic control was on one of them. So I, I told him, I said, pull in here. And uh, he pulled in and I went in and talked to a guy and told him, hey, I'm in, a, in the guard unit right up the street. So, you know, can I join the Air Force and get out of that? And he's like, yeah, sure, no problem. So I was like, all right, well, I want to be an air traffic controller. 
And uh, he's like, ooh, yeah, that's really hard. You got to take lots of tests. And this is where it kind of started for me. I was like, you know, hey, I'll take any test you got. And so I take whatever tests uh, that you had to take and passed. And so I get this job guaranteed. And so joined the Air Force, got out of the guard. That's all I cared about. Didn't know anything about air traffic control. I just knew I had to get out of the guard. No. Well, that was a whole different experience than my Air Force recruiter. Oh, okay. <laughs> my, my, uh, I, before I joined the, the Marine Corps, I talked to the Air Force guys, and he's like, yeah, come on up. You know, we'll, we'll see what you got. So I did the whole ASVAB and everything, and he um, about a month goes by, and I'm like, hey, you know, what are we doing here? You know, And he's like, well, yeah, you know, when do you want to go? And I'm like, well, as soon as I can. He's like, well, yeah, I'll call you back, you know, let you know timelines and stuff. A month or two goes by, I didn't hear from him. I'm like, it was like, they could care less. I mean, a lot of people I've talked to that went to the Air Force, I had the same kind. You know, my, yeah. my son had a very similar experience where, you know, they, they could care less. But you go to any other recruiter, and man, they will they hound it. you, and they will take, you know. Yeah, I do. And, and, and my experience with the, the Air Force recruiter wasn't that, but I have heard similar. And I do know, even when you're in high school, you know, the Army and the Marine Corps in my high school super active in recruiting. I do remember that. A lot of kids I know joined the Army, joined the Marine Corps. You know, the other ones seem to be, the ones you would hear about joining the Air Force or the Navy were a way smaller percentage. I don't know if I got the right guy. No. But um, I did it. And like I said, my focus was just, you know, I associated my bad experience with the Guard, but when I got transitioned back to the Army as an aviator, I'm fast forwarding many years, I worked with many Guard units that were some of the best cats I've ever worked with. You know, I just, my experience yeah, every unit's different in that field obviously. artillery unit with right. that group of leadership just wasn't for me. Yeah. It was yeah. not conducive. It, it was not what I needed at the time. So going on in the Air Force, I mean, how, how quick was that? Was it like a yeah, it was two long. months, six months? Yeah, year it's, it's long. So the basic training was pretty quick. No, I mean, as far as from the time that you talked to the recruiter till the time that he actually got you in. Oh, God, it was fast. I bet yeah. you from the time I talked to him that first day, I was probably leaving two months later. Oh, wow. That's real Maybe good. Maybe three. It was quick. Yeah. Yeah, it mm -hmm. was real quick. And then I remember leaving. You know, I went home and told my mom, yeah, hey, I'm joining the Air Force. I'm leaving. And she wasn't happy. You know, my mom's a big, uh, you know, not that I was anti, but my mom was real pro-education. You know, my mom comes from a different country, learned to speak English, listening to the radio. Right? So she... And, and worked hard and, you know, got a degree as an adult and got a good job and worked to the top. You know, all this, this, the traditional right. things you would see like with parent, our, our generation of parents, right. Yep. right? So when I told her, yeah, hey, I'm quitting school and I'm joining the military, she was not happy. And I remember when I left my comments, I brought this up at my retirement ceremony in 2011. I looked at her and said, hey, don't worry, Ma, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I just left, right? Yeah. And, then, and then the journey started. And... uh yeah, it was, you know, it was interesting. It was good. You know, a lot of growing up, but I got to, that was my first, I would say my 13th Foxtrot experience, you can relate to that, was my first experience into kind of technical work, you know, because when you're calling for fire, there's a lot you had to know, a sure. lot you had to understand, a lot you had to do, but I didn't understand that about myself at the time, that that would ultimately be excelling in those environments you know, that requires some technical application and understanding is basically, I look from that experience to now, that's been my whole life since then. But I didn't know that about myself sure. until I got there because I was never really focused on school. I was always, I always did okay. You know, I, I didn't do great, but yeah, I did, I did fine. You know, always played sports. I think kids do a lot better when obviously they're interested in what they're doing. You know what I mean? I think a lot of times these kids get lost because you know, they're doing this mundane stuff and they're like, man, I, you know, I could care less about this stuff. And some teachers or even parents will think, okay, well, you're failing. You're not doing what, you know, you're not applying yourself. Well, you know, if you're not interested in it, it's a, it's a lot easier to uh, make yourself more intelligent if you're interested in it. You know what I mean? So, Correct. That's a, that's a big thing. And then I just think at that age, there's just so much you don't know about yourself. Mm -hmm. And we as parents that have raised kids now, you know, you're trying to impart these lessons on them, but you're imparting the lessons from the perspective of an adult. And they just ain't there. Right. So that was something that I just kind of learned over time. And I tried to implement with the kids growing, you know, with my kids growing up, where I tried to do it just a little bit different. 
and there's some, you know, there's some pros and cons to that. But uh, yeah, so so going in the Air Force, how long how long was that venture? It's a little over four years. Uh, the whole time air traffic control. Yeah, the yeah. whole time air traffic control. You know, I went to basic training. I didn't have to do all the basic training because I did Army basic training just sure. a year, a year, a year and a half prior, whatever it was. So you get the opportunity to test out. So I was out of there after a couple of weeks. And then you go to AIT, what we know as AI, you know, you know as B school or something, right? Mm -hmm. The Army, it's AIT and the Air Force is tech school. And that was months long. I can't remember, four or five, six months long. And um, I remember when we got there, the failure rate, then this was 1988, failure rate was real high, like 60% or something crazy. But when we started the training, I just kind of got it. You know, I kind of see in patterns and puzzles, and I just didn't find it overly difficult. I mean, literally, there was a phase where I was like, this is literally the easiest job I've ever had. Right. Because I got to sit inside, and it was air-conditioned. <laughs> All right. I just, no I more to, delivering furniture? Yeah. No more working outside. You know, I, you had to tolerate training. It was pretty tough when I got to my first duty station because the training was aggressive. And they would yell at you. And if you weren't performing, they'd unplug you from the position and tell you to get out of here and be embarrassed, you know? So it was that kind of environment. But I didn't get a whole lot of that because I just kind of saw the puzzle. So I just kind of got it early, mm. you know, and did that for several years. Where was you stationed at during that time? Luke Air Force Base in Arizona. Okay. Right, right on the very west of Phoenix. Yeah. So from Phoenix to El Paso, to go visit the mom. That's what? Yeah, eight, ten, uh, ten? seven hour drive. Seven? Okay. Yeah, for like 440 miles or something, right? So I went back once a year. She come to visit you much? Mm -hmm. She did. Yeah. yeah, she'd come out at least once a year. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're fairly close. Yeah, so it was good. It was good experience. And So you sound like you liked the job. I did. I, so uh, what made you... <laughs> something popped in your head. No, like, this is... It's I got to get out of here. Strictly or accident. So... <laughs> I came timed for my re-enlistment and I didn't want to re-enlist. So I took the air traffic control exam to be an FAA air traffic controller because a lot of people I worked with were getting hired at the time. So you could take a pretest. I remember I remember this clearly. I had a friend I worked with who who paid the money for the FAA seminar. And I didn't have the money. So I said, Well, can you give me copies of the stuff? And he's like, yeah, no problem. So he gave me copies of stuff and I read and I took some practice tests and I just went and took the test and I scored as high as you can score on it. And um, got an interview like a month later. And um, I wanted, you put in a request to where you want to get hired and I put the Western Pacific region because I want to go to California. I love California. So I had an interview that went real well and uh, the indication was I would get hired at Los Angeles Center in Palmdale. And literally weeks later, the government went on a federal hiring freeze. I think uh, I remember that time. Yeah, this, this was 1992. Yeah. So now I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? Right. So I just kind of figured it out and just, you know, I figured ah, it won't be that long. But that federal hiring freeze lasted like five years or something. It was crazy. Yeah, I don't remember being that long. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, I'm not saying it wasn't, but yeah, I, don't, I forgot it was that long. Yeah. That long. So, when I had ultimately made the transition into flight school to back to the Army, I got a call from the FAA when I was a W-1 at Fort Bragg. Well, wait a minute. Yeah. Let's not get there yet. Yeah, yeah. So you're in the Air Force. That was just tying up the FAA. Right, I got you. The length but, of time. So you were in the Air Force, didn't want to re-enlist, so you took, you took the testing and everything you was trying to get in the FAA, mm -hmm. FAA mm -hmm. before you got out of the Air Force, or was you already out of the Air Force? No, that was before I got out of the Air Force. I had all my interviews while I was still in. So you got out thinking that you're going to get hired, and then after you're already out, they were like, uh, "No, not, correct, not yet. Uh, okay, correct." You know. Well, then, yeah, yeah. So now it's that's like a, that's a you, pickle. Yeah. Now, I, fortunately, while I was in the Air Force, I did go back to college. I went to night school, and whenever I could, you know, in the Air Force, I worked shift work. You worked days, swings, and mid shift. Like your days were. 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. swings, 2 p.m. to 10, and mids were 10 p.m. to 6. But after I completed my initial training to be, get my certifications uh, at my facility, then I just I went right back to college. And so for my whole, you know, minus my first year, and that includes in that year, I would say that includes basic training, tech school, and getting certified. 
my last three years in the Air Force, I went to college all the time. Okay. And uh, so I was, you know, I got, was able to get a bachelor's degree. And then lo and behold, I, I, I did much better in class. You know, I just needed that few years to kind of grow up a little bit, you know, become a little more, a little more, a little more, di a little more disciplined and to maybe understand the game, mm. right? Yep. The, the game is broad, but some things, you know, it, it, it dawned on me. Okay, well, the game requires you to get a college degree. Ah, shit, I might as well go get a college degree. Yep. <laughs> right? Yep. So becoming compliant, I guess. So that's what I just did. I worked and I went to night school, hung out with my friends, and uh, it was fortunate. So when I, when I ETSed, they went on the hiring freeze, so I just had to kind of figure out what I was going to do. You know, and I kind of just muddled through life for a couple of years. I mean, life was still going on. I had a good time. Uh, but, you know, got, got a job and had an apartment and paid my bills and, you know. Where was you living at? I was living in Phoenix. Phoenix I, just, okay. I just stayed. You know, it's a, I, I love the city. It's great. Yeah, it's beautiful out there. They got everything. Yeah. It's super hot, super hot in the summer, but they, I mean, I learned to water ski out there. I went snow skiing, going to the north. Yep. Uh, any sporting event you want to go to is there. Uh, I loved it, you know. So. My first experience out there was uh, I was living in an RV because mm -hmm. I was working for Boeing on a temporary contract, so I didn't want to get into any kind of long term lease because only like a six month gig, you know. Mm -hmm. So I went out there and I gone outside and like you said, it was like 140, 150. So I mean, something ridiculous. Yeah. And there was something I had to do with the generator in the front of the RV. And I get out there, and I'm in black flip-flops, and it was on asphalt. <laughs> and, I, and I'm working on this generator, doing whatever. And I lift my foot up, and it goes. Yeah, and I'm like. Rubber melted. My, it melted on, yeah. on asphalt. I'm like, this I had is a, insane. When I was in the Air Force, we, we used to. So I worked in a radar approach control, a RAPCON. So it's a building with no windows, and it's environmentally controlled because you have all that, you know, equipment Computers in there, and they got to keep it cool. Yep. And a friend of mine um, had a, uh, back in the day, he had a Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi Eclipse, nice little sports car. And he just got his windows tinted or something. He's like, hey, come check out my tent. And a lot of times in the heat of the summer, people would leave their windows cracked. But he had the windows tinted, so he couldn't leave them cracked. And we went out, and his back window had exploded. Oh, that <laughs> black bubble window on the yeah. Eclipse had exploded from the, it was so hot. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. But uh, yeah, it was good. So, so being in Phoenix, some, I mean, I can tell you my experience, but I want to hear yours. Mm -hmm. How did you learn about do, going into the Army? I mean, oh, I, you yeah, don't yeah. learn about going in the Army, but I mean, as far as like the programs that they, that yeah, you yeah, actually yeah. went into. So I knew, so I knew about the Army because I grew up around the Army, but I used to play a lot of basketball. And uh, so I played in a couple of basketball city leagues. And uh, over the course of time, there's a guy I'd played against multiple times and we became friends and he was an army recruiter. And one time he was like, uh, you know, he got to know me and he understood, you know, hey, you're an air traffic controller. Well, hey, do you fly? Nah, nah, I don't fly. I just talk to the planes. He's like, man, and <laughs> I laugh at this, but this is how it went down. He's like, you should be an army recruiter or an army warrant officer. And I looked at him and I was like, what's that? He's like, I don't know, bro. But they, <laughs> they fly helicopters and drive Corvettes. Yeah. And I was like, all right, yeah, I'm down with that. He's like, yeah, I think you got to take lots of tests. So I go right back to my other thing. I'll take any test you got. No. So that's how that process started. So, yeah. So I technically, you know, I was prior service, but when I got picked up as a warrant officer, I got picked up, you know, um, you know, I was off the street. Which is, you know, people that don't know about that, that's pretty rare. Yeah. I mean, they normally recruit from within or yeah. other branches or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Very rarely do they take somebody off the street. But, you know, that prior service probably helped a lot too. Yeah, but. I remember I had to take the tests. You you had to write a letter. I had to do a board as a civilian. So I was, you know, in my, had a suit and went and had a board in front of Army officers, which I had been to a plenty of boards when I was enlisted because they used to do airmen of the month and the quarter and the year. So I would do all that stuff. So all that was no problem. And then uh, I got selected. And so there I was back in the service again. Mm. Yeah. So I don't want to jump too far ahead, but 
the married part? Does that come in later? No, in that's, that happened in the Air Force. So I was, uh, when I was out in Phoenix, I met my wife uh, toward the end of my enlistment. We're, you know, just dating. And, uh, and so we, uh, when I ETSed, we probably got married a year after I ETSed. You know, she worked, I had a job, and we were just, you know, two young young kids yep. you know, to li- living in an apartment, right? Yep. And then when I um, had the opportunity, I was considering my options at the time when this whole flight school thing started coming into, into play was uh, I was looking at law school or flight school. And I got turned on to law school because my wife worked at a law firm. So we used to go to all these functions and it was a really successful personal injury, you know, law firm, am- ambulance chasers. Mm-hmm. But they were on the leading edge of like uh, advertising on TV and radio. I mean, all the, these guys were smart, man. And so we used to go to all these functions. And I just used to see all this stuff and I was like, I need to be one of these guys. All right. Yeah. So I was getting serious about law school. And when I got picked up for flight school, I remember that guy called me, hey, hey, congratulations, you got picked up. And I was almost like, my, I was ho-hum about it. I was like, oh. He's like, well, you don't sound excited. I was like, yeah, I don't know. How much time do I have? And I, for some reason, I remember him saying, well, you got, you got to let us know within 72 hours. I don't know where that comes from. I don't even know if that's true. But I was like, okay, I'll call you back. And literally, I called them at, you know, 71, 71 hours and 59 <laughs> right. minutes, you know. It okay. may be true because you know, you know how those board selections work. So they, they got all those people there that are picking people mm-hmm. and they're not there forever. Mm-hmm. So each each board is different with different people that they bring in. So they probably had to make a decision if they're going to, you know, choose right. a different candidate. So they, that was probably right. They yeah. So I, uh, so I uh, called them and said, okay, I'll do it. Right. And, and then, if you're going to make me. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> right. And again, didn't even know what it, you know. You know, I just heard helicopters and Corvettes. I'd never, I think I'd been in a helicopter once in AIT, but I didn't know anything about it. Mm. Uh, literally, you know, when you, you, you don't know this, but until you get to flight school, but you hear everyone bragging about their fast test and all that. And I scored this and scored that. And I think, I don't know if everyone was lying about what they scored, but I remember my score was literally like the lowest score you can make on the fast test. And, you know, I was just like, so the whole time I was just quiet. You know, mm. I was just like, man, I don't know if I can do this. You know, when we started flying, I was super nervous all the time. My stomach hurt. You know, I was just like, I don't know if this is for me. Right. But you just, over time, you're like, yeah, shoot, it's just like anything else. It's just stuff. I remember when I, I applied a couple of different times. And the first time I applied, I had, I had really good paperwork. You know, I was in the Marine Corps at the time. And, um. I was like, man, there ain't no way these are not going to take me. I'm a Marine, you know? I mean, that was the mindset back then. And so it took me forever to get together because, you know, you have to have all these dates within six months yeah. six months of each other. Yeah. So I would get real close, and then i get it pushed into some field op or a deployment or something. And so by the time I come back, I have to redo everything. I, you know, I don't know. This one major, God bless him, man. I mean, he probably wrote four different letters for me because the time – I mean, I had to put get this package together. I finally got it all together where all the dates were good, and but I was leaving in a week to um, go to Okinawa, and um, so I was like, "Man, I just put it in the mailbox and let it fly," you know. Mm-hmm. So it was over over to Okinawa, and it was going to take. I think the next board was in like two months or something like that. And um, when I was over there, I come back, you know. Qualified and unselect, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess right. that's what they call it. So, man, I was bummed. I mean, I was like, okay, well, I guess I ain't going to do that again, you know? So, I'd come back and, you know, my wife is like, well, are you going to reapply? I'm like, no. I mean, they already told me they don't want me. I mean, why would I do that? And like, well, you think I want to get smacked in the face twice? You know? Right, right, right. She's like, well, I've never seen you let somebody tell you no. And I'm like, and then, you know, that popped that ego. And I'm like, yeah, you're right, you know? So yep. I had pretty much the exa- exact same paperwork, same write-up, same everything, but I brought it to Kinko's. You remember Kinko's back mm-hmm. in the day? Yeah, I brought yeah. it to Kinko's. They put everything in a nice little little binder, yeah, yeah, glossary. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I had a picture on the front. I mean, super professional, and I submitted it. And yeah. 
all it was was a presentation, you know. Right. Which right. was a very good lesson for me. That's right. That's right. Um, so that's how I got in. And what year was that? Oh, man, 98, 99 ish. Yeah, mine was 95. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when I, I remember calling them back, okay, I'll go. And, you know, my wife was on board with it. You know, that was a big change for her because she wasn't, you know, we dated when I was in the Air Force, but she didn't know anything about the military. Even at, by the time I retired, she still didn't know nothing. You know, right. she just needed to know where the hospital was and the commissary. Yep. That's all she cared about. Yep. Right. Um, so, yeah. we. So she know. never got any of the wives' clothes or nothing like that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not, probably, probably one experience and then that was the end of it, right? Yeah. yeah. So it was uh, when we, when I got into flight school, you go to Fort Rucker, obviously. We did our time there, and then my first duty assignment was to Fort Bragg, the 82nd. So when I got there, we were still pretty young, and the, my troop was pretty young, and we didn't have any kids, and a lot of people in the troop didn't have any kids. So it was a real party environment, right? So everyone, you know, cookouts and kegs and all that, that was very common. And so it was just a different environment, and uh, that was cool. There's nothing real formal, you know, every now and again. I had a big, I had a first sergeant that, you know, I was a leadership challenge for this guy as a, as a warrant officer. And I didn't know, I came to understand the army, obviously, because you're in it. But looking back on it, I'll have to say the two crappiest jobs in the army have to be a troop or company commander and a first sergeant in aviation. Why? Because you got a bunch of warrant officers walking around with their hands in their pockets and big fat mustaches. Yep. I had on sideways. And- correct. Correct. <laughs> And try to say something to them. Yeah, correct. So, needless to say, as a W one, I I did get the speech from my commander several times. Don't aff- don't confuse your rank with his authority, because inside so a first sergeant that just didn't we didn't mix real well. And uh, speaking of the wives' club, you know, one day like my wife just didn't go to a lot of those things. If somebody needed help, we'd help, but she just you know. So my first sergeant's like, hey, hey, chief, you know that was a hey, chief. You got to make your wife. Uh, uh, you know, your wife needs to participate in blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, my wife's not in the army, man. You know, and you can't, you can call her and tell her she needs to. I'm surprised the first sergeant said something like that. He did. He was, he was that kind of guy. And I think it was me too. It was me and him, right? So he's like, hey, you got to, uh, you know, you, your wife needs to participate, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, yeah, man, she ain't in the army. And I don't think you can make her act like she is. But if you want to call her, you call her and you tell her that. And you let me know how that Here's works out for her. Right. Let me know how that works out. Wow. So, uh, you know, but she, yeah, she just wasn't into it. But when I got to my next unit, uh, still didn't do a lot of that, but we had a, you know, uh, meals for families, you know, when there's lots of tragedy. So she always participated in that. And then once the deployment started after nine 11, you know, the, the moms that were back and the, the spouses that were back would get the kids together to play, to try to normalize some things while we were, cause everyone thought it was going to be short lived. Right. But little did you know, it was going to last forever the rest of our careers. Right. So, uh, so yeah, but she didn't, you know, she, I, she always did her, her own thing and I always supported her doing her own thing. Right. Uh, so how long did you stay in the 82nd? A little less than three years. No. Yeah. Uh, so you jump over what we're getting ready to talk about now. Or, right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Quick break. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So you were in the 82nd, <clears throat> um, married, did you kids yet? Nope. Uh, yeah, my son was born when we were there. Um, I want to say probably, uh, a year after we got there, he was born. Um, so that was brand new dynamic for sure. Uh, he was born and then like two weeks later I had to go to the field, Mm. you know, typical army stuff, right? Or military stuff probably in general. Um, so yeah, that was a interesting time for sure. What year was this? 19, he was born in 1998. 98. Mm-hmm. So do you have any deployments overseas with 82nd or was it just? Nope. Okay. It's just all local training stuff. I think Bosnia. Yeah, that kicked off. Um, that was around that time. I don't know what was over there. Yeah, we never did it in the 82nd. And then I assessed, you know, for the 160, the 99. Okay. But uh, so he was born there and uh, we did a lot of field. Ex- we were in the field all the time. So a lot of, you know, local field exercises and then a lot of, in the, few years i was there jrtc i bet you i went i would volunteer to go with other troops because i just wanted to learn the craft as a you know air cav scout right so i just want to get good at my job 
And uh, so I'd been to JRTC a ton of times in those three years. And that's what ultimately spurred me to transition to special op- <laughs> yeah, Yes, yes. Right. One, one rotation in particular, you know, made up my mind for me, you know. And uh, I was like, yeah, A, I'm either going to get out of the army or I got to do something else because it just wasn't for me. So if people don't know, 160th is a special operations aviation regiment yeah. up at um, Campbell. And basically that unit supports most you know, Green Beret, SEALs, any kind of special operation type thing. Those are usually the people that will insert people or fire support or whatever right. whatever the case may be. Right. So what, um, first, how did you even find out about that? Because I'm when I was in the first got in the Army, I didn't know nothing about the Army. You yeah. Know? And I had no idea. That was even a thing so many years later. Yeah, strictly happenstance for me. Two things. Number one, there was a guy in my troop who had assessed. He was fairly new, but he assessed while he was like at, I don't know, Fort Drum or Hawaii or something. And then PCS, he had to, you know, he assessed and made it, but had to PCS. Already had orders before that? Right, something, you know. So he wouldn't say much about it, but I saw, and then they came and they had a flyer up in the hangar. Hey, we're having this meeting. So when we'd gotten back from a JRTC rotation that just went horribly, I saw this flyer and I was like, I'm going to go to this meeting. And I was still a W1. And uh, I went to the meeting and they had the guy there and, you know, had his crisp uniform on and his GSG-9 boots and his Oakleys, you know, on the top of his head or whatever. And I was like, yeah, I got to, if I'm going to stay in the army, I got to give me some of that. Yeah. And uh, so I, you fill out a thing, a attendance, you know, contact letter, sheet or whatever. And I submitted, I didn't think anything about it. And then I got a call back a couple months later. Hey, we haven't seen a packet from you yet. And that was a standard. Well, I'm trying to get more NVG time. And well, I'm trying to, because you're really, you're like, there's no way they'll take a dude like me. Yeah. You know, two years out of flight school. No way. And he was like, yeah, just, you know, get that packet in. So I got with a couple of senior guys, senior W-2s and junior W-3s in my troop. And I said, hey, I'm going to try out for this thing. I need some help. So they, they, they squared me away. Uh, you know, we started doing you know, more intense navigation training because my, in, in the cab, you know, it was all aerial recon and, you know, that, that, that was the mission, right? But I'd never done any time distance heading nav routes or anything like that. Yeah, so far, I forgot to even ask you, what was you flying back in? Kai, Kai Warriors. Kai Warriors, okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we did some training like with that. I had a, one of my friends, you know, we'd go to the pool three or four times a week because I was really a good swimmer. And I'd practice swimming as much as I could. I could always PT. I could run forever and do a push-ups until it was time to stop. And all, that was never a problem, but I just couldn't swim, you know. So I worked on that stuff. And then I assessed and was fortunate enough to make it. So how's Green Platoon? Uh, it wasn't bad. It was, it's, um, it's good. It's purposeful, right? Which is probably a lot different than some of the training that you'd had before. It's huge. So here's my takeaway from all my army training. And literally, I think I've been to like every aviation course the army offers. I think I've been to, uh, but the best courses of training I've ever had in the army, number one, believe it or not, airborne school. That's one of the only courses I've been to where they teach you everything you need to know about doing a job. Everything. And there's literally not one wasted day. And it's only three weeks, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, as I reflect back, I thought of that. I was like, man, this airborne school, it sucked while I was doing it. But when you really think about the training, they literally, to do that job, they taught it to you. Yeah. So I just thought it was impressive. And then Green Platoon was like that too. Not, there's not much make, wasted time and they are... They are focused and they are ramming it down your throat and you're taking it. So is there any teaching going on at that time or are they just testing your skills? No, they're teaching you, but they're teaching you, you know, it's, it's, sometimes it's in a painful way, but it's a professional, it's a professional course. And, you know, um, the generation of instructors I had then were, you know, a lot of them were plank holders in the unit and they were some of the most formative influences in my aviation life. And uh, it was a professional, um, structured task, condition, and standard course. So plank, plank holders are basically people that were there from the very beginning. Right, yeah. right. Um, so it was, it was great. So once you do the green platoon and get 
Is there anything like flight school in the Army to where you, you know, the top guys choose their aircraft, or is it more, hey, no. we think you're going to do this? And Yeah, well, you go, when you go to Green Platoon, you know what aircraft you're going okay. for. So you're, you, when you assess, they're pretty much telling you. you know, so you didn't have a choice whatsoever? Well, you do. You'll request it on your list, and they'll accept you to as assess for that. As a matter of when I assessed initially going there, I was going to fly 47s because they were taking Apache guys and Kiowa guys and making them 47 guys because they needed more 47 guys. So I was like, yeah, whatever, I'll fly anything. So I got to fly the 47 in the daytime, but I still did the AH-6 at night in my AH-6 IP. Um, he was my assessment. The person I dealt with on the whole assessment. I flew with a 47 IP in the 47 ride, but if I remember correctly, my AH6 IP is the one who walked me over to the hangar, mm -hmm. you know, and hey, this dipshit's going to fly with you all today, okay. right? And then he picked me up afterwards and I continued on. And then some, at some point in time after I'd been accepted, they said, yep, no more. We're not, uh, we're not giving guy. We're not giving aviators uh, multiple modern aircraft. Because remember, they went through that thing. If you had Hueys or fifty eight Alpha Chucks, you were out unless you had a. Yeah. So Did they had advanced airframe. Yeah. So they weren't having. They weren't letting folks swallow up multiple advanced airframes because you still had guys in the regiment that were Huey guys and fifty eight Alpha Chuck guys. So we had AH six guys. I learned this after I got to the company, but we had AH six guys that they sent to the forty seven AQC so they could have a modern aircraft and not get kicked out of the army. Yeah, because the AH six isn't a modern aircraft or MH six. Yeah, even the new AH six I. Uh, no, I don't think it's. I don't know what the army classifies, but it, I've flown the AH six I. Yeah, and that's is one of the most modern aircraft there is. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, it's, it's awesome. I don't understand why, but it's. I, uh, I think yeah, it was the standard <clears throat> at that time. You know, Apaches. 47s, Blackhawks. Gotcha. If I remember correctly, we had a guy that was a fixed wing pilot flying AH6s. He was an Alpha Charlie guy for like two years and went fixed wing mm -hmm. for several flying C12s and assessed and got picked up for AH6s. He had to go get a 47 transition oh, wow. to have a modern aircraft, if I remember correctly, because mm -hmm. even fixed wing didn't count when they were doing all that downsizing. Yeah, that's not a thing anymore. As soon as they started Flight School 21 and all that, you know, everybody's got a modern aircraft, right? Uh, so going to the company, mm -hmm. after all that was done, is there like a, very, you know, at the end of flight school, we're like, yeah, here's your wings. Like at so, the end of Green Platoon, we're like, hey, yeah, welcome it's, it's, and beat you up or something. Yeah, or as I like to say, <laughs> you know, you, you graduate Green Platoon. So basically you get your beret and you get to wear your beret. But you, then you go to the company, and that's really when the real work starts. Uh, for you know, I may not be this the same for everybody, but for me, the company was way harder than Green Platoon. But I've heard other people say it differently. Uh, Green Platoon was the biggest adjustment ever. I didn't find Green Platoon to be overly difficult, but the company was tough for me. I would think it would be because you got a lot different personalities, and, and, and more to me, personalities. It, it wasn't with. the personalities; like the personalities were tough, but. I was still, I think, you know, for a lot of it, I was suffering from imposter syndrome. I wasn't convinced I belong, mm. you know, because here I am, I'm in this room and I'm looking at all these guys and I was like, holy cow, man, these are like superstars of superstars. What am I doing here? So, and then I wasn't very long out of flight school, so I didn't have a whole lot of experience or time. So I was still thinking deep in the back of my mind shit i'm still trying to learn how to fly helicopters and right. i'm in the room with these dudes <laughs> literally yeah. these guys you know well i well you know a lot of people would use that as an excuse for themselves you know yeah. like well the reason i messed up is because i don't have but I, I know you and i'm sure that wasn't your attitude no it wasn't because the way i looked at it it didn't matter like you're in the room so the standards and that's what that organization was built on the standard is the standard you can either meet the standard or you can't. I can't. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, doesn't matter what the excuse is. Yeah, we're not mad at you. Yeah, you yeah. just can't do it. <laughs> just can't do it. And I've right. seen people get washed. In. You just can't do it. Nothing personal. You just can't do it. Okay. So I just knew I didn't want to be one of them guys. Was your wife, I'm, I'm sure you told her all about it and what was going to be expected and some of the deployments. I mean, how did she feel about you going in that kind of? Uh, I think she, you know, she was, she was cool as long as I was cool. Uh, I didn't know much about it. 
And I didn't, let me, I think different people focus on different things. I'd known folks in Green Platoon that quit because they were just like, man, I just don't know life in the company. Uh, and you guys are gone all the time and it's super dangerous. But I think they arrive at that by their own, their own doing. Mm. Because you don't know. You don't know what it is. Sure, you may be gone a lot, but you're going to, okay. The way I rationalized it was I can be gone a lot for a week or two weeks at a time, or I can be gone a lot for 12 months at a time. It, it all balances out over the course of a career. Sure. Now, we'll get back to this later. There's something to be said for the continual short deployment that has a, a different level of wear and tear on you that at the time you don't even understand until you've lived it for a long time. Then you're like, holy, oh, now, now I get it, right? Um, but uh, I didn't really focus. So, so with that being said, I don't know if I really, you know, contaminated. I didn't really say, oh, yeah, it's gonna, I'm going to be gone all the time. It's going to be this because I didn't, shit, I didn't know. But she's pretty comfortable. Uh, and by that time, by the time I got done with Green Platoon, we, you know, my daughter was born right when we got to Fort Campbell. So I remember my wife took the kids and went to my mom's house for almost all of Green Platoon, for at least basic skills in Green Platoon for a couple of months. So I didn't have any, I was literally sleeping and working. Well, for, which is probably a good thing. It worked out for me. Yeah. I didn't have any, I, you, know, you want to say distractions, but you don't want to call your family a distraction, right. but I was literally solely focused on not washing out of this, this training. Sure. And that was, that was good for me. I mean, I was, I didn't do anything, but you know, I was either planning for a mission, a training mission or briefing it. And if I wasn't doing that, I did my PT at the gym. And if I wasn't doing that, I was sleeping. That was it. You know, and that was good for me. So being with the company, how long was you in the company before you got actually deployed somewhere? It happened pretty quick. Uh, I bet you. I got to when I mean deployed, not a mm -hmm. training event. Yeah, shortly after I got to the company, 9-11 happened. Mm. So um, I bet you I was in the company six months. And 9-11 oh, wow. happened. So boom, there you go. Time to learn quick. Yeah. <laughs> and I was, it worked out for me. I got to go on the initial deployment because I was the new guy. Just, you know, well, not be, you don't get to go because you're a new guy, but I was also maintenance qualified. So I could fill two seats, basically. I could be a BMQ, you know, left seater in somebody's aircraft. Yep. And I could be a maintenance test pilot if something broke. Now, the regiment has its own maintenance company. Or, you know, they got a maintenance company that does, you know, those MTPs are the best. Line MTPs are, eh, you know, okay, I could do a track and balance if you give me a good, you know, prop and rotor guy. I can I change can, the oil. You know, I can do this <laughs> if you give me a good TI, right? Yeah. Um, but you could still... You know, you could, you could sign aircraft off, get them up and running. So that, that worked in my favor on getting on that initial deployment. So, yeah, when we deployed, I was in the, you know, fortunate enough to be in the good first group of guys that got to go. And I was the newest guy. But it was solely based on if I was an MTP qualified, I wouldn't have made it on that first push. No doubt. Where'd you go? Um, uh, we went overseas staging out of an area. Okay. And then just kind of, you know, found your wait, way into wait, it. Waited for, waited for our turn. Yeah. 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 So the first time you pulled the trigger, because I'm, you're, so you're on the attack side, you're not on the 40, so, well. Yeah. On the, so on the Kyle Warrior side, you know, we had gunnery side, you know, we shot, we had a 50 cal on there and, you know, um, I progressed to, at Fort Bragg as a pilot in command pretty quick. So I'd done, you know, what I thought was, oh yeah, man, I've done gunnery, but. Uh, gunnery and, and, and B company is different. Uh, you shoot way more from a training perspective. You know, I think of your time as an Apache guy. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, you probably went to the range, you know, three times a year. If the, yeah, we went to the range twice a week. Right. It's, it, you know. And our kind of firing at that time is you fly to an ABF <laughs> yeah. behind a hill somewhere. Pop up, shoot, come back down and fly back. That, yeah. that was basically what... You went to the range so much that 
after a period of time, you would find excuses to try to give your seat to somebody else to go mm. to the range. That's how often you go to the range. It was crazy. So when people say, hey, we did this and I could shoot a rocket or do this, yeah, yeah, because you, I mean, you literally, you know, that organization was, res they, they would resource and had training programs to get you to standard and they had a standard and you had to meet the standard. And so it was, um, they were, they were, you know, we were resourced properly for that for sure. You know, so um, you were literally, when you deploy, there's really no train up for, for a standard. You know, you can, yes, you may train up for certain missions, but if the balloon goes up, that outfit is structured to go. No. Because you were literally training all the time. That's what was, that's what was impressed, you know. Yeah, like regular army, you know, hey, you're going to be going over here. When are we leaving? Well, we're going to be leaving about six months. So you need to go to the range, get qualified. You need to have, you know, yeah. that's how regular army. So if work. we back up, you know, this will put it in a context for me. This is why when I was in the 82nd, I was like, I don't know if this is for me. And let me, let me start with, I served with some, some folks in 117 cab there that were some of the best warrant officers I'd ever served with. And I've been fortunate enough to link up with a couple of them here in my second life in Alabama, because they, they support companies and projects out of Redstone Arsenal too. So the guys that were young superstars then are superstars now as, as we're old guys now, yeah. right? So I was really fortunate to meet them, a couple of those guys then, and, and still, you know, have contact with them now in, in a personal and professional setting. But we did a JRTC rotation when I was in the 82nd. And uh, we went to Geronimo FLS flight landing strip. And our engineers, our Alpha Troop commander, had the engineers build a berm around our assembly area. Well, didn't think much of it, but they built the berm from the inside out. Then we got the Louisiana rain where it rained for like four days. And literally, we had Swimming our pool. assembly area and we had a moat around us. Right. <laughs> and the fighting positions were on the other side of the moat. Yeah. So what it ended up happening is the berm got breached from the outside coming in by the op four and literally the whole task force got killed. Mm. So, you know, when you, you know, the deal, when you get killed, you got to go to the PHA and I can't even remember what it stands, prisoner something, yeah. whatever it yeah. is, holding area, prisoner something, holding area. And, uh, there were so many of us, we just sat idle for two <laughs> days playing cards until, right. until we got reconstituted. Right. And so when we got back, we had our brigade commander at the time who I got to know after I retired and he was retired, but he was awesome. Awesome. Great motivator. And, uh, he was given a speech when we got off the C-17s about this was the best rotation the airborne division ever had. And I remember him saying that. And at that point in time, it was like, uh, um, the cartoon where the parents' voices are wah, 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 yeah. whatever that is. Right. I remember thinking, holy cow, man, I have got to get out of here. <laughs> this, right. I, can, I, I cannot do 15 years of that. No. And so that's what was the catalyst. And then I get to the regiment and you are literally trained to do your combat mission right now. And that was one of the most impressive, I say one of the most the other impressive thing. I just got to work and meet and stand next to some just really impressive cats. Mm. Right. So what was some of your um, most memorable deployments that you had that kind of still stick with you? And there, I mean, I know there's lots of them, but yeah, it's, I'll tell everybody's you. Everybody's got their one or two that are like, that's the one. Bill, it's dumb, man, for me. It's not really, I mean, the missions are great. You providing a service to your customer on the ground because they need you. You know, if you're a light attack helicopter pilot, that you're there because they need you, right? But the stuff that resonates, you know, there was some great accomplishment. But the things that make me smile and laugh is just the goofy stuff you do with your guys yep. when you're deployed. Whether it's somebody acts up in a card game, uh, just that kind of stuff. You know, we had one of our guys was clowning one time and was acting like a jackass after a card game and ends up dislocating his knee. So it's that kind <laughs> nice. of stuff yeah. just because you're, you know what I mean? And it's funny, the stuff that you think's funny at the time. Right. You know what I mean? And something that pops out in my head, we were, when, I, when we were going to Iraq, we were staged down there in Kuwait. That's no big secret what we were doing. And, um, you know, they still had this big fear of scuds coming in. Mm -hmm. 
And I'll mention this guy's name because I know he's going to watch us. And I don't even care if he doesn't want on here, but I'm going to say it anyway. So we'll just call him Todd. This guy named Todd. So about two days before we were supposed to jump, of course, you know, you get everything out of your area and you're packed up ready to go. So you're basically sleeping on sand for the most part. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and so it was at nighttime, man. It must have been like one or two o'clock in the morning. And uh, we all had our bags packed up to, you know, throw an aircraft. And that's all we were basically out of our, our, our sea bag and stuff. And um, about two o'clock in the morning, you just hear the ground. You just feel the ground. It's like, boom. I mean, it just shook. Well, all of a sudden, the sirens go off, right? You know, hey, you know, my, you know, getting your, getting your stuff. So everybody's putting their NBC gear on. And I'm like, man, that didn't, that didn't, that wasn't an explosion. That was like a something hit, right? You know. So I, I mean, yeah, I was doing the thing, getting my stuff together. Well, Todd was like right next to me. So we get on, and everybody's flipping out putting putting their NBC gear on because you know they they think they're gonna get gas and uh, for whatever reason the back of my mind I'm like that ain't gas but I'll I'll play the game or whatever so I'm putting my stuff on. Well I see Todd kind of like panicking because all his stuff's in the bottom of his uh-huh. back. And he's just throwing stuff he gets all his stuff on and he gets his mask on and um uh, and I'm looking at him and I can you know when somebody's talking with a mask on, they're always muffled. Right. Well, when Todd's talking, he's got his mask on. Well, I can hear him like he's <laughs> sitting there talking to me. And he's cussing up a storm. He's like, this son of a boy, what the hell? You know, and a lot of a lot of choice words going on. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, what's the problem? He's like, what the hell is this? And he's pointing to his eye. Well, his eye <laughs> thing was gone. Was gone. <laughs> I look at him, I'm like, I'm like, dude, you're gonna die, man. He's like, man, shut the hell up. Where's my dad? I'm like, you're gonna die, man. I'm like, just you know, face yeah. it, get yeah, over yeah. it. Hold your breath. And I was laughing so hard, and he was so mad. He th- you know, he was panicking. And I, and looking back on it, anybody else, you were like, you were laughing this guy? He's like, yeah, yeah. he's getting ready to die. I'm like, well, yeah. Because well, <laughs> yeah. it, it was funny. It's You're absolutely man. right. The things that resonate make you laugh. Yeah. Let me, uh, I'm going to make, run, hit a quick pit stop one more time. Yeah. yeah so what I didn't tell you about Todd was, <laughs> you know, being funny, stuff like that. It, it was actually a tornado that got shot down. You probably remember it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Got shot down and uh, it was friendly fire. And that was the big boom that mm-hmm. caused all the chaos with us. <laughs> So any any other uh, cool stories you can tell me? I mean, is there anything that you can tell me about the actual mission specific? I've never been a big talker about that. Let me I think. I know you haven't. That's why I'm trying to pull it yeah. out. Yeah, that's always been. Uh, give me just a second to kind of process a few things. Um. Yeah. If you don't want to talk about it, we won't talk about it. Yeah, most of it's uh, a little weird um, for a couple of reasons. It's um, some of it, you know, you look at from the OPSEC perspective, but a lot of it, and you and I have had this talk, as you start to process the things you did in that role and how they impact you now, working through that is still... I think yep. I'm still working through some of that. I get it. You know, still there. So I, so I focus on, like I said, it's all the goofy stuff. Yeah, uh, a lot of that stuff too. You know, you you push it so far in the back of your mind, and you know, I'm I'm sure you know about that documentary that they did with our unit and everything. And up to that point, man, it had been shoot over ten years before they did that. Mm-hmm. And uh, and all that stuff. I mean, yeah, you remember, but it was like as soon as it's there, you're like, okay, yeah, and you, you just move on to the next thing. Well, that documentary, they were bugging me every other day, sending me cuts. Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? What do you think? About this? Right. Hey, watch this. Blah 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 blah. And after doing it for so long, you know, when I watched the movie for the first time, of course, it you know it brought back a lot of bad stuff, but. Going through it over and over and over, that effect kind of went away a little bit. Mm-hmm. It made it uh, made it better anyway. Right. Because I've never talked to Carrie about that. I never talked to Nate about that. I never talked to anybody about it. I mean, of course, you know, they ask questions. Well, what happened? Well, you know, this happened. Blah blah. blah. So you never went into specific. So the movie or the documentary for me was very helpful for me 
um, because I didn't have to tell the story. You know, there's a lot of stuff, obviously, that happened that wasn't on there, mm-hmm. but they actually got to see a real footage of kind of some of the stuff that went on over there. Right. So then they could ask questions rather than me telling a story, which, yeah. is, which is a lot easier, you know. Yeah. And I so. think, yeah, I, I would I would agree with that approach. And also just from an individual perspective, the whole um, talking, basically telling the story. Yeah. You know, I I can tell a story. I excel when the story's funnier. Right. And the because it's kind of the self-deprecating role, right? right? But I struggle when it's the, you know, the hey, look at me story. I just I struggle with yeah. that, right? Um yeah. that's a t- that's a tough one for me. But yeah, I can I can contribute. You know, I a guy that I was a um station with, I just saw a, a podcast he did with somebody and you know, he's he did a good job. But he's obviously more comfortable in that role of, you know, talking about some of that stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just I just get a little uncomfortable with it. I I will, you know, I feel comfortable talking about, well, what motivated me to go this route? How did I feel about it? You know, if did I like, you know, when I look back at it in totality, did I like, you know, what I did or would I do it again? That kind of stuff. Mm. But the op- actual, um, you know, details of it, I'll, oh, I always skirt around that a little bit just because uh, it's just a little uncomfortable. Yeah, I get I it. Well, you know, especially talking in a format like this, you know, it's a lot different if me and you were in a car, yes. which we've been at and talked about stuff. Sure, for sure. And, um, so with that said, I mean, what helped me a lot is after all that stuff, you know, the, the documentary came out, me and Carrie had a lot of hard talks, mm-hmm. which we never had before. If you ever had, if you had talks with your wife, has she been able to help you through some of that stuff? Or? Uh, not a whole bunch. We have recently though, talking, my daughter's actually been on it after on what's going on. And, you know, between, you know, in, in, in Israel and Palestine, mm-hmm. right. You know, cause my daughter's younger, she's a first year law student. And, uh, so she has some thoughts and opinions. So we'll talk, you know, and I'll kind of give some perspective. She'll have some really good thoughts and well, Hey, how come this or that? And sometimes I'll come in with like, well, when you're looking at these situations, you know, and I can speak from a little different side of the coin a little bit mm-hmm. that kind of enlightens her that we've never talked about. Sure. Right. But, um, but yeah, I think we're, you know, um, we haven't talked a whole lot about it. And for me, it's not, there's some, you know, some things that you may, maybe don't want to get into. And I just think from a personal perspective, uh, for lack of a better term, I just feel kind of, you know, and this is just me, like, you know, I've listened to some of the guys I was with that have podcasts and some of them are entertaining. Some of them I'm like, well, I don't know, man, you know, Maybe that's somebody else's story. Maybe not. But some of them are entertaining. But uh, I, yeah, I struggle with, uh, you know, with that aspect of it a little bit. There's a couple of things I wanted to go over with you before. I know you got to take off your soon, so I want to get to it. I, I, I really want to talk about your parenting style because it was a lot different than mine. And I just happen to be very, very lucky with my son because I don't think I was a very good parent. <laughs> right, right. I um, wasn't there a lot. And when I was, I really wasn't present. Um, so I got lucky the way he turned out, but I've, like I said at the beginning, I've, I've, I've seen you and I've heard the stories and how you approach stuff. And I I think it's something some people can really learn or at least get a different perspective of. So how, you know, when somebody talks about discipline, a lot of people automatically think discipline while you're spanking your kid or, you know, whatever. Um, the, the way I've seen you discipline your kids is I was like, man, I wish I would have even thought of something like that. Um, when I, when I was raising Nate, an yeah. example that I remember is the whole Xbox. Oh yeah. And so that, that was, that was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that was a thing. Right. So yeah, I didn't, um, uh, I'm, I'm with you though, you know, Bill, cause we had a lot of, we were in the, in the service in the same period of time, you know, our kids aren't far apart in age and it's hard, you know, uh, being gone for big chunks of time in a combat environment and coming back because you just said something was key. You may be home, but you're really not present. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was the same way. Um, you know, I think a lot of times then you just kind of learn to fake it being present. And then, you know, but there were certain things I was into. I will say, you know, my son, 
I tried to be consistent with the kids. My son's the oldest one, so he gets the you know the first one or the oldest one always gets the worst, nope. right? Because you're it's learning an experiment. It's an experiment because <laughs> right. you're trying to learn how to be a, a damn parent. You know, a dad. What does that mean? I don't know. You know, you take what you think it means. So, uh, you know, I was probably a little too, a uh, little too hard on him. Now, I've had people tell me, "Nah, look how they turned out." But my 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 comment is this. I'll start with this comment. When you're first going through it, you think that there's one million things that are a big deal. But after you've gone through it, you realize there's like five. Right? Mm. So quit focusing on the one million for people who may listen to this and pay attention to what the five are. And what that means is you're probably going to end up with the same quality of kid and you guys might have a better time while you're doing it. It'll just suck less. No. Nope. Because when you're harping on these one million things, it just sucks all the time, right? No. So I would certainly go back and redo that uh, for sure. Yeah, I was definitely guilty of that. Yeah. You know, the little stuff you're like, I'm trying to teach you not to do it. Why are you doing it? You know? yeah. And when, and you, when look, you look at the gross, the grand scheme, it doesn't it, matter. Like, it doesn't matter. That was stupid. Why right. Because <laughs> we're sure, but it's a fine line because you want to teach, you know, you know, task condition and standard, right? But it's sometimes we forget that, yeah, we're, we're, whether we're 30, 35, 45 year old parents teaching a kid or a teenager, yeah, they're a kid or a teenager. Of course, they're not going to see it like we do. You know? And you got to let them be kids too. You got to let them be kids because if they saw it like you do, we would call them adults, not kids. I felt like I was an adult when I was about Same. 10, 11 years old. And I wish I could have went back and Same. been a kid. Same, you know? Same thing. Yeah. I tell my kids all the time, you know, I was, I was able to function, take care of myself at, you know, nine and a half, 10 years old. Cause that's what it, that's the environment I was in. Right. Um, so yeah. Um, uh, so the discipline thing is key, right? You know, you try to teach some form of accountability. Uh, but the, the, uh, the play, it was actually a PlayStation. I was deployed and, uh, and you know, my son was getting pretty lippy with my wife and, um, before he was always a big gamer so i had always a lot of parents i knew saw that as a problem oh they need to be outside more this that and the other and to me you know sure they need to be outside for some level of f physical fitness but if you have a kid that loves to be in the woods or you have a kid that loves to game i don't really they got to love to do something mm. and we're all different so you have to have balance in everything so i just kind of looked at it like that so my son happened to love games well the power when your kids love something is now you got leverage right? Yep. Hey, if you don't do this, then you can't do this. And that was the best leverage ever, right? Um, what we, uh, so the one time I think she gave him the old, if you don't do this, then this happens. And it was about playing the, you know, you can't play the game anymore. And he said some comment about, I don't care. I don't like it that much anyway. So I got home. She told me about it. I walked up in the bonus room and he was sitting there watching TV and I got the game console off the thing unplugged it, wrapped the cords up. I'm putting it in the box. And he's like, what are you doing? I said, well, you told your mom you don't care about this and you don't like it anymore. And he just stared at me and I walked out the front door, went across the street and I gave it to the neighbor. <laughs> Walk, uh, walked back in and looked at him, shrugged my shoulders and went back to doing what I was doing. Right. Yeah, no yelling, no nothing. Yeah. That's the impressive part. It's, you know. it's also, it was a similar thing of our, of our mutual friend, Joe. Mm -hmm. I was at Joe's house. And I remember this one. That was crazy to me. It was just awesome though. Right. And I, but it was, it was one, probably the, one of the better lessons Alex had gotten in a long time. Yep. So for the, for the, for the, the discussion. Yeah. When Joe, I was standing there in the kitchen talking to Joe, Joe said something to Alex. Alex was looking at his phone. Joe walked over, took the phone out of his hand. Started walking towards the garage. I followed him. He put the phone on the ground, got a hammer, and smashed it into a bunch of pieces, gathered it up, walked back to the breakfast bar, and set it in front of Alex. <laughs> I was shocked. <laughs> right. And the reason I, first, I remember what went through my mind was two things. Number one, well, that was a $450 commitment right there. And number two, Alex sat there and didn't say a word. So that told me something. That told me that he know he knew the boundary that he crossed and, and took it as opposed to why did you, there was no, well, why did you do that? He knew why his dad did that. Right. And to me, that was a indication of solid parenting. Mm -hmm. 
So it got me reflecting task, condition, and standards. So I always worked real hard with the kids to let them know, you know, you, you've got to do this for these reasons. And if you don't do that, here's what's going to happen. And then you got to follow through. As painful as it is, and for us, us that were gone great periods of time, it's hard to stay on the follow through because you come back and you suffer from this massive guilt from being gone all the time. And that was always a huge challenge for me. And it was this internal struggle. Here I am coming back in the family and I'm and setting I, rules. And, and I got to start stomping guts out, yeah, right? Yeah. But we, my wife and I talked about it and we just, I just stuck with it even as much. I mean, there's times I just didn't want to. And then I was fortunate after a period of time, her and I kind of flip-flopped roles. And we, it was nothing active on our part. It was just kind of the way the relationships with the kids went. And then we kind of switched back. So that was, you know, that was helpful. You know, I got a little bit of a break. But uh, it was exhausting for sure. But we just stuck with it. I And I had an old neighbor in Clarksville, retired field artillery first sergeant. He was from Detroit, from the inner city. So this guy was about as street as you could be, but he'd been in the army his whole life. So he was an army guy. And his kid, so my kids were, my, my kids were super small. They were four and two when I met him. So his kid was like 13. It was the best behaved kid on the block. And I remember asking him, hey, T, you know, and uh, T was a big built middle-aged dude, drove a Corvette and was a janitor at the middle school. And I remember asking him, oh, you're a janitor? And he's like, yeah. When I retired, I started working at this plant managing people, but it was too stressful for me. So I wanted a non-stress job. So I'd just go, I'm a janitor. I change light bulbs, clean the floors, mess with the kids, help the teachers and come home. So then I remember, you know, that just kind of was, it was funny to me. And, um, and then I asked him about his kid and he's like, yeah, he just looked at me and he looked at them and he says, no matter how hard it gets, you got to keep leading. And that just always resonated with me. No matter how hard it gets, you got to keep leading. So we'd come back from these deployments. It'd be hard, you know, setting the standard was, you know, dressing down the kids or fixing something was the last thing I wanted to do. Sure. Yeah. I just wanted to watch TV and joke around and play if that was possible, but we stuck with it. Um, Looking back on it, I wouldn't change a lot. You know, I would go from the million things to the five and just acknowledge that there's a lot of things that just aren't that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. uh, I also had a tendency to make everything a lesson. I'd like to maybe, un if I could unwind that, I would do because now knowing more about people and even us, sometimes you just want to chit chat. You don't necessarily want to be taught anything, right? But yeah. I understand why we made everything a lesson because you think, well, I'm going to go back over pretty soon and I might not come back. So now I've got to give you everything that I got today, right now. Right. And so it's that inner, you know, inner struggle there that uh, I don't think I fully understood at the time. You know, and then you just realize that, you know, everything's a lesson and your kids, all they hear is Charlie Brown's parents after a while, right? Yeah. Wah, 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 wah. But you're doing what you think is right because you think you've got to pour everything out into them because you're just not convinced you'll be here next month to do it. Sure. Yeah. Right. That could, that's exhausting. And it's not just exhausting for us. It's exhausting for them too. I can imagine. You I know? can imagine being, you know, me being my dad. Right. Probably right. wouldn't have been fun. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, man. So yeah, thanks for going over that with us. Um, so getting out of the military, I know, you know, you did some contracting work. I did. And yep. then um, at some point, you're like, probably like the big army. You're like, I, this ain't for me. I yeah. want to do something else. Yeah. So it, so I, I, when I retired, I was set up pretty good because my last five years in the 160th, I worked in our SIMO office, Systems Integration Maintenance Organization. They've kind of reworked since then. But you're basically a, a project manager you know, doing some acquisition stuff and some research development and testing stuff. And uh, so I got to learn, I got to develop a different skill set. And I tell folks all the time, uh, that was the worst job I ever had in the Army. But probably one of the best decisions I've ever made in the Army in terms of aligning myself for a post-Army career. So when I retired, I got, I, we moved from Clarksville down to Huntsville and I got a job at, uh, out on Redstone Arsenal with a, a company as a subject aviation subject matter expert. 
the company I got a job with, the guy who got me on, who's my now business partner, I was stationed with him in the regiment. He was an avionics technician. And he didn't retire from the Army. He got out, got an engineering degree, and ultimately went to Huntsville as a contractor. And so he got me on with the same company. And um, they were real small at the time. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> and then uh, uh, we grew their aviation presence. And, you know, as I started learning more about the business, the first few years I worked down here, I didn't have really anything to do with the company. I just wanted to go to work. I wanted to leave work and I wanted to go home and, you know, live your life, live my life. And after about three years of that, I got to, you know, it took me about 14 months to kind of decompress. So what I tell folks is the first 14 months after I retired, I was just super unhappy. And, um, you know, the, what the saying I'll say at 14 months in one day, all of a sudden I was good and everybody will talk about, well, what changed? And I was like, oh, I changed. Mm -hmm. I think I got, I got comfortable with what my role was. You know, when I first retired, looking back on it, I think I felt guilty because I still had guys that meant a lot to me and I felt like I was quitting and I wasn't quite ready. And so that weighed into it. And then, um, now you transition. I went from this great, you know, the super high speed unit to, you know, the regular workforce. And the analogy I use is it took me time, and this sounds bad, but I think it's true. It took me time to transition from being the girl that everybody wanted to date to being the girl that nobody wanted to date. And that just took time. And then once I arrived at that place, I haven't been happier. I literally, I don't think I can think of a time when I was happier, right? So it, it was good. So I share that with whoever's listening because, you know, think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so being a, contra being a contractor, there had to kind of come to a point, you know, after that 14 months that you had a, something in your mind or maybe somebody put it in your mind. Yeah, like, yeah. My, you know, I want to try to start my own thing. My here. friend, yeah, with the guy who's my business partner now, he put it in my mind. He had always had a dream to have his own company. I was, I call myself the reluctant partner. And let me start by uh, another guy that I know said something a few weeks ago or a month ago that's kind of resonated with me. I look back on my life and I'm 100%, I've, you know, been an active participant. And when I'm involved in something, I'm extremely focused. I just have the ability to focus down and everything else is white noise and I don't even, it doesn't even phase me. But I, I do say, I'm still in somebody saying here, I believe more of life has happened to me than I've happened to life. You know, I'm not a, I don't, I wouldn't classify myself as a particularly innovative person, but I do look at things and I'm not scared to try something. And sometimes I'll look at something and say, I think I can do that better. Mm. Now just go do it. Mm. So my, my business partner, you know, then friend, now business partner and friend, he wanted to start his own company. He had a vision in his mind and his mentor told him to pick a good partner. So he presented this thing to me and I was like, I don't know, man, maybe, you know, we kind of talked about it and then we came at a place that made sense. And you know, as I just previously said, once the, the outline was done, I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm in. And once I'm in, it's just a matter of just doing it now. So, um, so it was, it was his idea. Uh, we went as, as partners. We had a, a good mentor. And I'll go, I'll go further. Not just a mentor, we had a sponsor, right? Mentor teaches you stuff. Sponsor enables your success. Mm -hmm. So they enabled us to, you know, we started our company and they set up a path for us to get our own contract and job sub back to us. And then we were just going to grow from there. And that's what it was. Yeah. So we, you know, we continued to provide support to a government customer. And then just kind of grow our business on the side. Yeah. So talking about growing businesses, you started out with just you and him basically yeah. paying for yourself. Right. And then that eventually grew to three to five yep. to 10, yep. 20. Yeah. So from back then, where are we now? I think we're at 125 now. Yeah. And if I remember. That's a pretty big accomplishment. So from the time that you started from, from the time you started till now, how many, how long has that been? Six years. Six years. Yeah. 
And if I remember correctly, what are you, 15? Is that your employee number? Do you know? I have no idea. Yeah, it'll be in the, on the timekeeping system Man. when you come in. But yeah, um, so it's been six years. Uh, a lot of growth, learned a lot. Um, I just came off direct support back in February. Mm -hmm. You know, I was still doing, I was still, you know, in the direct support world and on the corporate side for a long time. And uh, my business partner, he stopped direct support in the spring of 22. He was about a year ahead of me. So, um, so yeah, about 125 now. And uh, I think we're just starting to hit our stride. Uh, starting to get some, you know, starting to get staffed up on the corporate side. You know, when you start out, you wear all the hats and you do all the stuff, right? Hey, what do you do? Hey, man, I clean toilets and I pay bills, right? And then uh, once you start, you know, getting some expertise in there, now you can start. Uh, my goal for 2024 is to get out of survival mode, so to not focus on surviving, but to focus on thriving. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to be able to do that because we're starting to get some skilled expertise in place and processes on the corporate side that are going to allow the next phase of growth. Yeah, so what I really... What what really drew me to want to come work for your company was the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, kind of like having your own little group of friends, you know. Right. And trying to do what you could to to make that business successful. So as things grow, you know, you have that corporate mindset or however you want to put it. You know, everybody knows everybody. You know, when you start growing, obviously that's going to go away a little bit. Super, yeah. And I think you about that, Bill. You guys have discussions on yep. where you want to go or think, how think, you going to control that? Or I think about that all the time, right? That weighs on my mind, right? Because this is the this industry, you know, support to the government's the ultimate people business. Well, it's and especially if you don't grow, you die. And yeah, you have to. It's right. very, very competitive yep. where we're at. Yep, it's hard to stay. It's hard to stay the same. Some companies can do it. Uh, but but you, you're absolutely right. You got to grow. So I, the things Nico and I talk about. Um, let's back up. So you called what a week, two weeks ago. Hey man, I'm doing this. You know this podcast thing. I want to talk to you. Well, you know we've got history, so we're friends. But you know we're also coworkers, and part from the friend note, but also the coworker note is, you know. I make myself available, right? Which is probably very hard to do. Hard, right, because time, right? Yeah. It's just not time, but, but that's important, right? Because that's how you cultivate relationships and trust. So what do we do? We pick out on the calendar. Yeah, yeah, what works? All right, sounds good. Okay, what's the block of time? Yeah, cool, I'll see you there. So when you're asking people to commit to a customer in the company, you got to commit to people. So you got to make yourself available, right? You got to be able to engage. You just, if you're in the people business, you just can't sit behind a desk and not deal with people. Sure. So now as you get to grow, so back to your original question, as we start, you know, growing the leaders, you know, we all know, and you and I had some of this discussion too, as I've had with Greg and some other people that, you know, of our, our, of our generation and former military guys is you kind of get a feel for what people want to do, Right. And a lot of the guys our age, they're just like, hey, you know, I want to come in. I want to be, I want to contribute to something positive. You know, I want to be, you know, contribute to an organization that's moving in the right direction. That's doing good things. And I'd like to make a good living while I'm doing that. Okay, sounds good. Then you have other people that want to do those things, but I want to grow professionally. You know, so there's a challenge when you're in this, these, this direct support to the government force and how do you grow people professionally? And there's a couple of different things you can do, but the purposes of this discussion, as we start cultivating the next group of leaders, our challenge is going to be picking the right folks, you know, that whole saying, having, you know, the, the you know, you got to have the people on the bus, but you got to have the people in the right seats on the bus. And when it comes to leadership, I've got to, the people that are in the that seat on the bus have to understand people and value people like I understand and value people. So you have to make sure you make those designations and hires the right way. And then I think as you grow, you have a chance 
at, you know, keeping that feel and the culture that you're looking for. You know, it'll never be the same when you transition from 15 people to 215 people. Like when we go to the Christmas party, did you RSVP, by the way? No, but you know I'm going. So right. Make sure you RSVP. Right. All right. So, you know, you remember last year's, you you might have, uh, you guys, I think you went the year before, maybe not last year, didn't carry, didn't We went something. last year was the year before that we didn't go. Okay, got it. I had a flip-flop. But so we know that, you know, we had 50 people there, right? And uh, I mean, this one, I don't know, it might be 170 people there. So it's going to be a whole different thing. Well, I won't be mad if you don't say hi. I know you're not going to talk to everybody. <laughs> I say hi to everybody, right? <laughs> but, you know, so it's, um, so, you know, maintaining that feel. But I think it's all about cultivating the right, um, you know, leadership. I say leadership first slash management team. Uh, absolutely. Because in this business, we've you've worked, we both work for other companies. And a lot of times you have in a people business, companies will make the mistake. They'll have, in, they'll have people in tr- managing people that aren't good with people. Yep. You know, and that's a lesson learned probably from the military too. You know, you have one bad seed somewhere and it can spread like cancer. Yeah. And the people above them don't even know it until it's too late. It's too so, late. So, you know, in the military, you can't, a lot of times you can't choose who you have underneath you. It's kind of like designated to you. You got to work with what you got. Right. So it, it's definitely a better or unique position, you know, when you contrast it to the military where you have that build, ability to choose. Yeah. Um, the right fit. And you got to choose wisely. Yeah. And, you know, that's important. So I spend a lot of time thinking about that because mm-hmm. at the end of the day as an employer, what you have to remember, the folks that work for you, they got a choice. They work for you, go work for somebody else. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important to recognize that, you know, and uh, even embrace that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, obviously, you know, the area that we're at, I mean, yeah, it's, there's stuff everywhere. Yeah, if I'm uh, literally, I mean, if somebody's, you know, if somebody steps out of a job today, a lot of times they've got a job this time tomorrow. You know, um, so it's important to 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 understand that and uh, and to embrace that. Like I'm not, I don't worry about that. You know, because um, all I can do is we conduct ourselves, you know, honestly, transparent communication, and I think that's really. That's a lot of what people want, you know. Ev- everybody wants to make the best money, you know, possible, and that you know everybody wants these may want these other things too. But some of those things, um, you're constrained on by the contract, but you are not constrained on how you deal with people, mm-hmm. right? So to me, it's you know it's pretty easy in terms of the conceptually. Hey, deal with people like you want to be dealt with. So hard about that, you know. So I try to take that focus into it. But yeah, that was the journey. You know, I started, we started working for a company. Um, and then after about six years there, we started our own company. And then after six years of that, here's where we are today. You know, um, you know, I'm not sure what it ultimately looks like. You know, my business partner and I, we're about 13 years apart in age. So I'm 13 years older than him. So I joke all the time, my work life is much shorter than his is. That was going to be my next question. Yeah. Because there's a certain point that you got to be doing it because you love it, not because you need to. And I'm sure you was probably there even before you started. But there's going to be a time, whether it's very soon or yeah. have you looked that far to be hey, this is probably my time to step out. I've done what I wanted to do. Hey, hey guys, take it from here. Or is this something that you want to go to the very end? Great question. Um, so I, I love what I'm doing. And I love it for a reason that initially wasn't why I started doing it. It was some self-discovery that happened. So we initially got into, I agreed to do this because my kids at the time were in high school and they're both, you know, pretty high achievers. So I, I was trying to figure out how I could monetize my skill set. You know, I needed to make more money because I wanted to be able to get my kids through all their post high school education debt free. Understanding that you don't have to go to college. There's a million ways to make a living. Mm -hmm. But they were on the college path. I didn't want them to get out of college with a bunch of debt that you see because I just think it encumbers, it just traps them forever. Sure does. Yep. 
So that was my focus. I need to make some more money. And then my mentor at the time said, well, you probably need to work for yourself. You know, you're going to work way harder, but you'll make more money. So it didn't, you know, I said, okay, cool. I'm willing to trade my time, more time for money. So that was really my, my motive, the catalyst to get me going. And then as we started going and we started growing, you know, like you said, you go from one to two to three to seven to 12, then we got to 15 pretty quick. And then you kind of stall out, you know, then we get to 25, then you stall out again. As this is going on, I realized, sure, the money's fine. But what was really motivating me every day, because we were literally working 60, 65, and sometimes 70 hours a week for years. I was like, heck, doctors don't even work this much. Mm. Uh, what was motivating me was I enjoyed getting good opportunities and giving good people a good opportunity to you know, pay their mortgage or send their kids to college. That's, that was, that's what was motivating me. Mm. Right. And that was a I, something I w wouldn't have thought of a couple of years prior because I didn't really, I didn't put that much thought into it. I was just like, oh man, my, you know, my kids are high achieving. They're going to get into some good schools. I got to figure out a way to pay for these colleges. Yeah. Right. But then I transitioned to this point like, hey man, it's really, I think it's cool to, you know, get some good, good solid work out there and give good solid people the opportunity to get good solid work so they can, you know, hopefully achieve their goals mm -hmm. to, to play a part in that. I just found awesome. Right. Um, and I can't remember the original question. So the original question is where, oh yeah, where do how, we, yeah. How, where do you so, get off, get off the train? So yeah, getting off the train. So I am, my focus for this year also is to become a better goal setter because believe it or not, I have never really been a goal setter. You know, earlier I said, I think more of life has happened to me than I've happened to life. And as I told my kids, cause my, you know, one of my kids is, you know, what am I going to be doing in five years? You know, is literally that person. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know, man. I've never been that person. I have literally stumbled my way into every room I've ever operated in professionally. And Me I just, too. I just kind of excel when I get there because there's a core trait, right? You know, I, I work real hard. Uh, I try to listen more than I talk, you know, that all these things, right? I try to solve problems. I try to bring value. I try not to complain, you know, these, these things. Um, but I'm going to try to be a better goal setter this year and that will enable that's on the list. That's on the list right now. I think conceptually speaking, I, my time will be my time. It may come down to when I think I'm not providing the val the, the right value. And I'm not saying I'm getting a taste of that, but. I'm getting a better understanding of that as we started to staff up now because I've able, been able to hire some support on the corporate side before I was doing it all. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing a lot of everything and probably nothing really good, right? <laughs> right. But now I've no joke for these, for three key positions I have, I've went out and I've hired no joke professionals. So what that will enable us to do is to solidify our processes and to get postured for the next round of growth mm -hmm. because I was operating, I was redlining and you know, you think your, your profitability may be up, but there's an opportunity cost because you're just not doing the job the way it needs to be done. So now that I've hired some professionals in these key areas, you know, in the accounting and finance area, the, the contracts area and the human resources area. Right. So now I get to step back from that and kind of redefining my role. And then I want to make sure that I'm bringing value to the table. So I, I will say my personality is not one, you know, if I'm not bringing value, I'm generally just not interested. That's just my personality. Uh, so that will, I think that will drive what my exit looks like. Um, and, you know, financial considerations will be tied into that for sure. Right. But I think to me, it's about the value proposition. Um, I think where I'm excelling now is, you know, I've always been a worker. I've always been a problem solver, but I do, I do relate to people. And I think I, I think I hire pretty well. So I feel confident in how I build teams. So I'm going to build the most competent team possible to get us posture. My business partner is going to be thinking about our strategic direction. We're going to get those things lined up and we're going to, hit that next round of growth. Yeah.
Uh, but, but yeah, so this this coming 2024 is when I'm going to really try to get become a better goal setter because I have not, I've always just kind of knocked down the targets when they popped up in front of me. Sure. I can't, I can think strategically, but I don't know how strategic I've been in my application of life. You know, I, I can, can understand that. Yeah, yeah, I can see the big picture and I can read the room and the landscape and, you know, kind of look at the options available, but I don't know how intentional I've been with that. Well, you're doing something right. Yeah. I think a lot of it's just, you know, you know, uh, you know, some timing, some opportunity and luck, I think has a lot to do with it. You know, I don't, a lot of folks will sit there, well, hey, I do this, that, and the other. And I'm kind of of the opinion, I don't know, man, there's really no new tricks. Hmm. Certainly for a person like me, that's not an innovator. Uh, to me, you know, I got involved in this industry because I worked in it and had a little bit of knowledge in it. And then I just kind of looked around and was like, I don't know, I, I think I can do this and just kind of got after it. But even with that, you still need some luck. You still need some timing and opportunity. You know, we had, like I said, we have my business partner and I had a couple of, you know, um, a couple of mentors and sponsors who really were super helpful to us that I'm, I am eternally grateful to. Um, you know, a lady that, that hired me to work for her and her company. And then the guy who came in a couple of years later as the president, you know, they've just super duper, you know, I met, I met them at a, one of the Christmas parties. Yeah. Just, I don't think it was last year. It was probably the year before. Yeah. Or the one prior yeah. to that. Cause I wasn't there for that one. But. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Three years ago. Yeah. yeah. Just super, you know, so, so yeah, it's, you know, those types of folks. Uh, yeah. And he seemed very happy. Just for you guys, it, yeah, it, it genuinely. Wasn't, it, it wasn't like a. He was like taking any credit for anything, although he probably deserved it. He was genuinely happy for yeah. for you guys, you know, so, which shows you what, what kind of person he is. Yeah, yeah. he's one. Yeah, one of the greatest guys I know for sure. Right. So we're, you know, I I look forward to being able to do that for somebody or 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 people sure. moving forward because I just think it's I think it's great. So. It's good for your soul. Yeah, hundred percent. And and you know, now that you say it that way, going back to what I said earlier about having a good opportunity and hiring good people, so they can go out and achieve their stuff. Yes, yeah, just just good for you. Yeah, I mean, look, you you kind of built this. Right? Well, you sent me. I tell you, I tell you this way back when, <laughs> and you may not even remember when you bought your Ram fifteen hundred, and you sent me that picture, and you said thanks. Yeah. I turned into an old sappy guy, man. My <laughs> eyes are getting all watery. I'm looking at the text and I can't even see the text anymore because my eyes are all watery, you know? And I'm like, God, God damn it, Bill. <laughs> you know? But yeah, you know, it, it's important, right? You know, but at the same token, you, you send me that thing and say thanks, but I send you the text and said, thanks for picking me, right? Because, I, <clears throat> you know, I needed that too, right? Well, you know, some people don't, I'm not trying to, go too much in into this part of the business but um the way that you brought me in i've worked for a lot of great companies and some that i um didn't really want to leave but you know contracts had run up and yep. i had to go other places but i had never i was never approached the way that you approached me yep. talking on the business side of it you know mm -hmm. you, you was basically like what do you want from us and yeah. You're like, all right, when you start, I mean, it was no. Right. And it's always felt like a, like I said, like a, like a family. <clears throat> and I, and I, obviously I know it's going to grow and this, it'll get away from that a little bit. But, uh, I mean, I know me and you're even when you're done and I'm done, well, for sure. Hook up somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah it's a case in point sitting here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. In Lacey Springs, which 13 years I've been out here, I've never been to. So don't tell anybody about this. Yeah. Because this is the best kept secret. Yeah. You know, never been out. Everything here. out on the other side of the hill, there's people going everywhere out here. It's I mean, you can pretty much do whatever you want out yeah, here. Yeah. I I I when I very, up very and saw cool. your place, I was like, this is impressive. So I like it, man. No, this is good. I appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks for coming, man. I appreciate Anytime. it. I know you gotta go. So we're gonna wrap it up here. Um yeah. Maybe, we'll, well, you probably got to go. You ain't got time for no lunch or nothing, bro. Yeah, I got a motor, yeah. man. Okay. All right, man. Sir, thanks My for man. coming, buddy. Always. All right, bye. We'll see you. All right.